All right, here we are. So I guess you were surprised by this. Um, yeah, because a few people asked me about uh, having it online today. So I thought, why not? You're on your way to spring break anyway. Um, <clears throat> we can um, do this just as easily online as in person. So what the heck? <laughs> um, I'm sure you were used to it uh, during the COVID. This was a regular thing. And now it's good that we can still do this once in a while as you know, circumstances require it because uh, you never know, the weather can be awful or, you know, there could be problems with COVID and things like that. So, um, so today, and of course, the great thing about this is that we can record it so that if somebody can't be here today, they can go ahead and watch it. And so, um, by the way, all the videos for this class, when it's done, if you do want to watch the video, uh, Moodle doesn't actually have enough room on it for videos, I've been told. Apparently they suck up so much space that um, it just doesn't work. So um, I just use YouTube. Okay, so um, I have a YouTube page here somewhere, which I use very extensively during the COVID. <clears throat> so I have an enormous inventory of videos. And if you, um, I guess from your side, you would just have to type in my name or something and you, it would, should take you right to my account. And once you get there, um, under a playlist. This is something um, that I discovered, which is a good thing that it's here because, um, you know, like I was saying during the COVID, I had so many videos and um, this way you have an opportunity to organize them. And so when we're done today, now, <clears throat> one of the bizarre things about playlists is that you can't actually create one until you have your first video ready. Don't ask me why. So as soon as this recording is ready, and, and they do need to be processed, by the way. Um, when it's ready for um, MP4 format, then I will post it in here and it will create a new playlist for us. Um, oh, wait, no, what am I saying? We already did have one. I forgot all about that. Well, here they are right here. Excellent. So um, I'll just add it to these existing playlists. I actually, I really did forget about that. We did have one other online meeting. So you already know how this works. That's good. All right, wonderful. Well, then let's get to it. Um, we had started chapter 11 last time, which is our discussion about probability theory. And uh, I just want to quickly review what we've done so far before we get back into it. And I um, just want to point out that some of these functions are on your calculator. Not, not maybe a huge number of them, but some of them. So uh, wait, let me get mine open. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm looking. Ah, here we go. Okay, I've got it. All right, here we go. So we're looking here at probability theory, which provides a mathematical framework for measuring uncertainty. Okay, now, basically what we're trying to do is assign probabilities to uncertain events that may occur in the future. Now, of course, you know, it, it's hard to do this properly, but um, what we would like to do is have a rigorous mathematical framework that we can use to consistently calculate probabilities based on the information that we do have. And um, so for certain things, this works very well. If you're trying to forecast stock prices in the future, for example, um, well, <laughs> that's a different matter. That, that's a very tricky thing to do. In fact, some would say that you might be better off using a Ouija board, but um, but for many other applications, this, um, these two concepts are extremely important. And so we started out by reviewing the so-called fundamental accounting principle, which is where we discuss how many different uh, ways can objects be arranged. Okay, so you might recall that an arrangement means we take a collection of objects like these three cars, and we try to figure out how many different ways they can be parked in this three car garage. So in other words, we're trying to figure out how many ways they can be arranged from left to right. And so I made up a list and it turned out there were six ways we could park the three cars and each of these is called an arrangement. Now, rather than writing them all out, it would be very nice if we could come up with a formula that would let us figure out how many arrangements are possible with any given number of objects. And fortunately, such a thing does exist and that would be the mathematical operator factorial, which I'm gonna skip ahead here a little. 
factorial, and this is on your calculator, although it's labeled as X factorial, it's the same thing. If you look um, in the bottom left-hand corner, I believe, yes, it's almost exactly in the bottom left-hand corner. It's the very first column and um, the very bottom, almost, second from the bottom. And so the way it works is you type the number you're interested in, and then you hit that X factorial button, and it gives you your result without needing any equal signs. Okay. Um, make sure, though, you put the number first. In other words, if you put the X factorial first, you will not get the right answer. So this is how factorial is defined. Zero and one factorial both equal one. And then after that, each successive factorial equals that number times all of the next lower values. In other words, two equals two times one, three equals three times two times one, all the way through, you see, up to six, and then it just keeps going on and on and on. And as you can see, the numbers can get quite large very quickly. And in fact, if you go into um, your calculator and you try 10 factorial, you'll get a number that's more than 3 million. So it's, it's getting up there pretty quickly. And in fact, if you go up to 30, um, you can see that the number is so gigantic that we needed scientific notation to express it. And that little e there means you're multiplying this number by 10 to the 32nd power. Okay, so that's a standard uh, way of expressing scientific notation on calculators. The problem here is that there's only so much room in the calculator to show all the numbers. Um, it doesn't have enough room to show all the digits in this case. So instead it turns into scientific notation. All right, so if I remember correctly, we then went ahead and we may have started to take a peek at um, <clears throat> permutations. So let's jump ahead a little bit more. This is my the example. I don't remember if I did this in the class or not. This was meant to be kind of a fun example. Imagine that there's ex this exciting new artist and his works consist of an entirely white canvas with a colored dot on one side. And so you go out and you buy four paintings by this exciting new artist and uh, you decide or want to decide how many different ways can I hang these on my wall, assuming that you have room for all four of them. Well, based on what we've just seen, that would just simply be four factorial, <clears throat> which is 24. Okay. And in general, there are n factorial ways to arrange n objects. So that's all you have to remember. Now, permutations, this is a little different because what's happening now is that you're actually selecting objects from a larger group. And, um, and so in other words, with the arrangements, we're taking all the objects and, and changing the sequencing. Here though, we're choosing from a larger group. Now, if the selection order matters, in other words, if the sequence in which I choose these values makes some kind of a difference, or if the different choices can be distinguished from each other, then each one is known as a permutation. Now, um, I, 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 again, I don't remember if we did this example, but uh, let's just go through it again. Imagine that you've got a class with, uh, or actually there's, a, we start up a math club on, on the campus of SUNY Purchase. Um, and in fact, for all I know, there may actually be one, but let's just say there's 10 members of this club. And according to the rules of the school, in order to have a club, you must have a president, a vice president, and a treasurer. Now, nobody in the class, or sorry, in the club has volunteered to do these jobs, okay? They, they don't want to uh, volunteer. So I, as the faculty advisor, have decided to randomly assign the jobs. So what I'm gonna do is give each student a number from one to 10, and then I'm going to randomly pick three numbers, and the order in which I choose them will determine who gets which job. So let's say I pick student number three first, followed by student number one, followed by student number seven. So now that means student number three is the president, number one is the vice president, and number seven is the treasurer. So the important detail here is this. If I had chosen those same three numbers, but in a different sequence, let's say I'd picked seven followed by three followed by one, it's the same three students, but now they're doing three different jobs. And so what that means is that this selection is different than this selection in spite of the fact that they're the same numbers. And so that being the case, these are each known as 
permutations, okay? Each one of these is a permutation. So the big question now becomes, how do I calculate the number of permutations that I can create by choosing three objects from 10? In other words, how many ways could I have filled these uh, positions? Well, it turns out that there's a formula that's based on factorials. And so you can see how it works. The NPR stands for number of permutations when I pick R objects from a collection of N. Okay, N is the collection that I'm choosing from. R is the number of objects that I choose. And so in this case, 10, N would be 10 and R would be three. So I plug them in. And if you want to do that with your calculator, um, you'll see that I've got 10 factorial in the numerator and in the denominator, I have seven factorial. And so I calculate those two numbers separately and the ratio gives me 720. Okay. Now, if you happen to have the, uh, one of the more advanced calculators like the TI-84, for example, um, it already has the per permutation function built into it. Um, let me just, as an aside, mention this just in the off chance that you have one of these. You may have been required to have one of these in high school, for example. So um, what you would do is you go to the math. There's a math button in the upper left-hand corner. And then once you choose the math app, then there's a bunch of menus. You would scroll over to the right and pick PRB which stands for probability. And then you would scroll down to number two, NPR. Now, in order to actually execute this, on this calculator, what you would have to do is actually hit the 10 first for our example. So you put 10 and you go through all these steps. And then when you get to the end there, uh, what you would have to do, let me just double check this for a second math 10 math probability npr and then you would type three enter okay three enter and it would come back with your 720. okay so that way you don't even have to bother with this formula you just need to know n and r and you're all set. but if you don't have that calculator well that's not a problem because you've got the um the iPhone, which does at least have the factorial operator. So you can go ahead and do it like this. Okay, either way, it's fine. All right. So um, we also had, I don't remember if we got to this point either, but the horse racing example where you're betting on three horses and what order they finish in. So if there's eight horses and we can place a bet on three, uh, first, second and third place, the order in which we write down our numbers is going to matter a great deal because if I pick the horses one, two, and three in this order, I only win if horse number one wins, horse number two comes in second, and horse number three comes in third. If I wrote down two, three, one, I only win if horse number two comes in first, horse number three comes in second, and horse number one comes in third. So because the order matters, these are both permutations. So how many ways can I bet on this horse race? Um, well, guess what? There's, there it is. Eight is N, R is three. And so once again, you plug in the numbers and um, you can see I've got eight factorial over five factorial. And that's going to give you uh, the ratio of 40,320 over 120. And that turns out to be 336. All right, now, um, what about the case where the order does not matter? What, what happens then? So let's say we're picking objects from a larger group and the order has no bearing on anything. It's absolutely irrelevant. Well, if the order of selection does not matter, then instead of permutations, they are known as combinations. So when I choose are objects from a collection of N in such a way that the order does not matter, then each one is known as a combination. So 
here, you know what, here's an example. Now I like to use this one. Um, let me just sneak this in here because it's actually more fun than some of these. Um, suppose that you visit haagen in the mall. There's one in the white, the Westchester mall. Um, and discover that they are having a promotion today only. You can choose any, let's say two toppings for your ice cream for a dollar, okay? Now it turns out that they only have five toppings to choose from. You're, you're allowed to pick two. So let's say that they are um, marshmallows, Oreos, um, gummy bears. Uh, what else might they throw on there? Um, oh, peanut butter cups. And um, uh, I don't know, whip, well, is whipped cream really a topping? I don't know, I guess so. Um, oh, what the heck, let's make that a separate one. Okay, so now here's the thing. If, if I ask for marshmallows and Oreos, does it matter if I ask for the marshmallows first and then the Oreos, or does it matter if I say Oreos and then marshmallows? Of course not. All I'm doing is specifying which two I want. They're gonna grab those two and put them on top of the ice cream. The order has no bearing whatsoever on the results. So every choice that I have is a combination. So the question becomes then, how many choices do I have? All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. Um, with the letters. So we've got the choice. Let me just remind you, we have M, O, G, P, and W. All right, so let's see. M, O, M, G, M, P, M, W, O, G, O P, O W, G P, G W. Hmm. Oh, and I missed P W. Okay, sorry. Let's see. Is that right? Um. Yep, that's it. That's all of them. So there's ten. All right. So each of these choices is a combination. does not matter. So, well, now you're probably wondering if there's a formula. Well, of course there is. All right, let's see how it's different than the permutation formula. Aha, here it is. So you can see I wrote down here the permutation formula. The key difference between the two is that there's that extra R factorial in the denominator. And what that does is it reduces the number of combinations. So in other words, the number of combinations will always be smaller because we don't have to change the order. <clears throat> In other words, let's go back here for a second. Don't worry, I'll show that to you. In other words, you see how I have M and O. If these were permutations, I would also need to have OM as one of my choices, but here that's not the case. So therefore there are fewer combinations. And so we um, calculate this by also dividing by R factorial.
so um, let's do this. Let's calculate. Let's use the um, this formula for the um, toppings example. So for the toppings example, n is five because there were five toppings all together, and r is two. How many combinations are possible? All right, well, let's figure this out mathematically. <clears throat> That's always fun. Okay, so what do we have? So a quick reminder. This is the formula. So here we have uh, five factorial over five minus two factorial. Minus two factorial, or we can simplify it. It's five factorial over three times two factorial. Now, if you go to your calculator, or if you remember from what we did before, five factorial is 120, three factorial is six, two factorial is two. <clears throat> so we have 120 over 12 or 10, just as we figured out ourselves. Excellent. So let's just quickly run back. I've got one more example here. Um, we could probably use some more practice. How about this one? Well, first, let me make sure you're caught up here. You should have 10 for your answer. And again, if you're using the Chi 84, um, this is found on that same menu, the, the probability menu, but it's, um, it's one further down on the list. It's in there as well. So that means there's 10 ways we can choose our toppings. All right. Um, well, I have an idea. Let's make up another new one. That they can be so much fun. Uh, <laughs> how about um, suppose that you are allowed to choose? Um, oh, here's a good one. Three toppings for your pizza <laughs> for, I don't know, two extra dollars. All right, so there's this, like for two bucks, you can have three toppings. Okay. Um, the choices are okay, we have mushroom. Um, cheese pepperonis, um, oh, sausage, uh, meatballs, and everyone's favorite, anchovies. So now again, you can see clearly the order of selection is completely irrelevant. You just say, I want mushrooms, cheese, and meatballs, let's say. And whatever you ask for, they're just going to put it on top. So the order in which I ask for them has no bearing on anything. Oh, yeah, um, I, I actually have the ability to take care of that. I, I should have done it sooner, um, but yes, thank you. Um, I have, did you notice what I, I can actually go? If somebody forgot about that, I can just turn it off myself. So I'll try to be more vigilant about that. But anyway, um, yeah, we don't want, I've had that happen, you know, of course, during the COVID, uh, you know, that lasted a long time. I mean, really, it was about two years or so uh, where I was not completely in person. In other words, in the beginning, it was just 100% aligned, and then it gradually went back to this way. But um, there have been a few times when people had their microphones on, and they were saying stuff while they were watching this that, oh, I, let's just say that, um, 
I would I, I can't even imagine how they could have come back to class without being humiliated because they, they didn't know that they were being that everyone was hearing what they were saying. And um, there were a few times when, you know, it was pretty embarrassing. And so uh, now usually what ends up happening instead is that if it's on and nobody realizes it, it just picks up a lot of background noise. Um, and so especially if there's a household full of, you know, dogs and, and kids and stuff, that could be a problem. But I do have the ability to turn it off. <laughs> yeah, there were there were one or two times when I was just like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and everybody heard it, you know, and it was being recorded. But um, well, let's just say that we want to be careful. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, yeah, so this time and we're, I'm not going to write the list this time because we know how this works. So and in this case, N is six and R is three. So. Here's what I would like to do. Why don't we have you figure this one out before I show you the answer. So it's six factorial over six minus three, three. Well, I'm doing all the work for you, but go ahead, throw this into your calculator and see what you get. All right, I see somebody's got it. It is indeed 20, that's correct, yes. <clears throat> because six factorial is 720. Three factorial six. All right, so yes, there are 20 ways you can choose your toppings. So anyway, um, There's all kinds of other examples we could come up with. In fact, um, but yeah, I'll tell you what's interesting here. I'm gonna, this is just a little aside. Um, this is one of those things that you wonder how this could have happened. Um, everybody in their life has probably experienced or used a combination lock. And of course with a combination lock, you know, it's a big, I, I don't even know if I can even draw one properly. Oh my God, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it a little nicer. And there's a big wheel and there's a bunch of numbers on that wheel. And so what happens, you spin the wheel and typically you're asked to choose three numbers. And so let's say you choose a combination of one, three, seven. If you dial into your uh, lock, seven, three, one, will it open? The answer is no. So you know what that means then? Based on what we just said, each of these combinations is actually a permutation. So that means that they're not named correctly. They should be named permutation locks. That would be the correct name. Whoever chose the name had no idea what they were talking about. In other words, they're like, oh, these are combinations, aren't they? Well, let's call them combination locks. No. They're not, they're permutations. So um, if you have a combination lock, um, <laughs> just be aware that it's actually a permutation lock. It makes you wonder how this happens. How do people 
pick the wrong names for things like this. I don't know. I don't get it. It just means that whoever invented the lock maybe wasn't exactly a mathematician. So, all right. Anyway, now one thing that um, we haven't had a chance to do in a while is have videos. We, you know, videos are a lot of fun, especially the ones I have here. This topic lends itself particularly well to interesting videos. That's been my experience. And so I've got some that I was going to show you anyway, um, especially just before a holiday. I like the idea of having videos. So I I'm going to show a few of them right now. But what I would like to point out, though, and maybe I don't remember if this came up last time. The problem with the Zoom system is that if I try to show a video on my screen, um, there's a very real chance you won't be able to hear it. So what I'm going to do is rather than. Um, oh, and one more thing, this this happened once and I was very surprised about it. If I were to show um, a video on here and record it on the Zoom recording, I am theoretically am violating copyright laws. It's hard to believe, but it's true. And one time YouTube actually wrote to me and said, listen, don't do that again, because somebody complained about it. And I was really surprised. So what I have to do then is I'm going to send you a link to the video and I'm going to watch it here too, but I'm going to turn the recording off while the video was on so that we don't have any problems. Because, you know, they actually told me at YouTube that if this happens more than once, they could literally suspend my account. So, um, you, so later on, whoever watches this video, um, the the links are on Moodle. So if you are watching this video and you're thinking, well, what's going on? There's no video. That's the reason. And so what I'm going to do is, Jesus, I've got so much stuff open, I can't even find. Here we are. Um, yeah, so the videos are all, they're all here. So if anybody is watching the video and they want to watch along, you can click on these links and watch them because right now I have to unfortunately turn off the recording while we're, I'm showing them. <sighs> yeah. Oh, it's just unbelievable what goes on in the world. But um, yeah, so we're going to start with this basic probability. And then there's some other, these are more fun applications like how many ways can you arrange a deck of cards, the lady tasting tea, the last banana, the birthday problem. These are all applications. This first one is actually an introduction to what we've just been doing, but they do it in such an interesting way that it's definitely worth our while to watch it. So let me uh, click this on. And um, let's not, don't want anyone to get upset. So now I'm gonna put the link in the chat room. And then while it's running, I'm going to turn off the recording. So, um, and then you'll watch it there. And then when it's over, we'll, we'll go over it a little. So here it is. So check it out. So in the meantime, I'm going to pause the sharing. And then now you can watch it. Now I'm going to show you how I grammarly Here's my answer. And I'm going to click through grammarly suggestions in the right hand. Hi, I'm Rom. Welcome to Math Antics. In this video, we're going to learn about how to do math with things that only sometimes happen. It might be likely or unlikely. We're going to learn about probability. Usually in math, we deal with things that always happen the same way. They're completely certain. Like if you add one and one, you're always going to get two. If you multiply two and three, you're always going to get six. There's no uncertainty at all. But in the real world, things aren't always so predictable. Take a coin toss, for example. You can't predict whether it'll be heads or tails. It's unpredictable or random. And that's why some people will flip a coin to help decide which of two things to do. That's why I make every decision in life. Why am I not surprised? Oh, no. Good luck. But even though we don't know what each coin flip is going to be, we do know a few things about it. We know that with a fair coin toss, that heads is just as likely to show up as tails. The probability of an event, like getting heads or getting tails, is a value that tells us how likely that event is to happen. 
With our coin toss, since each side is just as likely and there's only two sides to a coin, if we flip the coin a lot of times, we should expect that about half the flips will be heads and about half the flips will be tails. That means that the probability of flipping heads is the fraction one half and the probability of flipping tails is also one half. Let's look at this in a little more detail on something called a probability line. It's a number line that goes from zero to one. A probability of zero means that an event cannot happen. It's impossible. And a probability of one means that an event is definitely going to happen. It's certain. That's why the probability line only goes from zero to one. An event can't be less likely than impossible, and it can't be more likely than certain. A probability of one half, like with our coin toss, means that an event is just as likely to happen as it is to not happen. A probability less than one half means that an event is unlikely, and a probability greater than one half means that an event is likely. Oh, and in addition to fractions, it's also common to write probabilities as decimals or percentages, since you can easily convert between those three. A probability of zero is the same as a 0% chance of something happening. A probability of one half is the same as a 50% chance of something happening. And a probability of one is the same as a 100% chance of something happening. Now that you know how a coin toss works, let's see an example of an event that is unlikely using something a little more complicated than a coin. Let's take a look at dice. A standard die has six sides numbered one through six. When you roll it, any of those sides is just as likely to come up as the others. That sounds a lot like flipping a coin, doesn't it? Each side of a die is just as likely to come up as the others, and each side of a coin was just as likely to come up as the other. So you might expect that the probability of rolling a three is 50%. But remember, with the coin toss, there were only two possibilities, heads or tails. With dice, there are six possibilities. That's going to make a difference in its probability. One way to think about it is that it's certain that one of those six sides will land facing upwards, which is a probability of one or 100%. But since only one side can face upwards for a given roll, we have to divide up that value among all the possibilities. In the case of a coin toss, since there were only two possibilities, we had to divide the probability by two. One divided by two is one half, which is the decimal 0 0.5 or 50%. But with the die, we need to divide the probability up evenly between six possibilities. One divided by six is one sixth, which is equivalent to 0 0.167 or 16.7%. So that would be right here on our probability line. That means it isn't likely that I would roll a three, for instance, but it's just as likely as rolling any other number. And since all six numbers have the same probability, each number should come up about as often as the others. To see if they do, I'm gonna conduct some trials. That's an excellent argument. Allow me to deliberate. Guilty. Actually, when dealing with probability, a trial, which can also be called an experiment, is a process that has a random outcome, like tossing a coin, or rolling dice, or spinning a spinner. And the outcome of the trial is what happens in that particular trial, like flipping heads, or rolling a three. So I'm gonna conduct several trials by rolling a die multiple times and keeping track of how many times I roll each number. Aha, you said that each number was gonna come up just as often as the other numbers. But look, there's more twos than there are fives. How do you explain that? Well, remember, we're dealing with things that are random. They're unpredictable. We can't know exactly what will happen, just what will happen on average. So now I have to calculate the average? Well, when we say on average, we mean that the more trials you do, the closer you get to the expected probabilities. Keep watching. There. Now that we've done a lot of trials, you can see that our totals are much closer to what you'd expect them to be. I guess you're probably right. That's one of the really important things to keep in mind about probability. If you do just a few trials, the results might not end up very close to what you'd expect. In fact, they could be way off. But if you do more trials, you increase your chances of reaching the expected probabilities. There's another thing I should point out. Remember the probability of flipping heads is one half and the probability of flipping tails is one half. The probability of rolling a one is one sixth, 
and the probability of rolling any other number on a die is one sixth. If you add up the probabilities for the coin flip, you get two over two or one. And if you add up the probabilities for rolling a die, you get six over six, which is also one. And that's not just a coincidence. If you add up the probabilities of all possible outcomes of a trial, the total is going to be one or 100% because it is certain that at least one of those possibilities will happen. Let's look at some more examples. For these examples, we'll use a spinner. If we had a spinner with just six equally sized sectors, the probabilities would be exactly the same as with dice. So we want a few more sectors. There, that's more like it. Now we have 16 equally sized sectors. So what's the probability of spinning a 12? Well, just like with dice, where we had to split up the 100% between all six possibilities, we'll do the same thing now, but we'll split it up between 16 possibilities. So the probability of spinning a 12 is one over 16, or about 6%, which is right here on the probability line. We can see that the probability of spinning a 12 is less likely than the probability of rolling a three. And that makes sense because there are more possible outcomes with our spinner. But what if we color some of the sectors a different color and we wanna know the probability of spinning a certain color? Now we have five sectors colored blue and 11 sectors colored yellow. So what's the probability of spinning a blue? Remember how with the coin toss, we ended up with the fraction one over two and with the die roll, we got the fraction one over six. In both cases, we had one as the numerator. And that's because we were interested in only one of the possible outcomes, like the probability of flipping heads or the probability of the number three being rolled. But in this case, the top number of our fraction will be five because any of these five sectors will give us the color we want. And the bottom number will still be the total number of possibilities which is 16, because that's how many total sectors we have. So the probability of spinning a blue is five over 16, or about 31%. That's still considered unlikely, but it's more likely than spinning a specific number. And this method will work for figuring out the probability of any event. You just make a fraction with the numerator as the number of outcomes that satisfy your requirement, and the denominator as the total number of possible outcomes. Let's try the same method to find the probability of spinning the yellow. Our top number should be 11 because there's 11 yellow sectors. And our bottom number should still be 16. So the probability of spinning a yellow is 11 over 16, or about 69%. Now we finally have a probability that's considered likely. And it makes sense because you can see by looking at our spinner that it's more likely to spin a yellow than a blue. And you'll notice if we add up 5 over 16 and 11 over 16, we get 16 over 16 or a probability of one. So that's a good sign that we did it right. Let's look at another example. Suppose we have a bag of marbles. There are three green marbles, seven yellow marbles, and one white marble. If we mix them all up and pull out a marble at random, what's the probability of it being green? Well, the top number of our probability fraction will be three because there's three green marbles. So there's three outcomes that get us what we want. And the bottom number will be 11 because there's a total of 11 possible marbles that we could pull out. So the probability of pulling out a green marble is three over 11 or 0 0.27 or 27%. It's right here on the probability line. That means it's unlikely. And that makes sense because you can see that it would be less likely to pull out a green marble than one of the other ones. Let's try this again for calculating the probability of pulling out a yellow marble. This time, the numerator of our fraction will be seven because there's seven yellow marbles. The denominator will still be 11 because there's still 11 marbles total. So the probability of pulling out a yellow marble is 7 over 11, or 0 0.64, or 64%. Another example of an event that's likely. How about pulling out the white marble? Well, the top number will be 1, since there's only one white marble. And the bottom number is still 11. So the probability of pulling out a white marble is 1 over 11, or 0 0.09, or 9%. Not very likely. And if we add up these probabilities, we get 11 over 11, or 100%, just as we expected. All right, so you should have a pretty good handle on basic probability now. You just have to remember to make a fraction with the numerator being the number of outcomes that give you what you want, and the denominator being the total number of possibilities. And we learned about the probability one, and that a probability can't be less than zero, or greater than one, or 100%. We also learned that the more trials or experiments you conduct, the closer your results will get to the expected probabilities. 
course. The way to get good at it is to practice. So be sure to do a lot of problems on your own. And as always, thanks for watching Math Antics, and I'll see you next time. And I sentence you to five years hard labor. Learn more at mathantics.com. All right. Well, you know what? That was covering the material that we're going to be doing soon. Um, in other words, not exactly combinatorics. That's actually coming up next. But um, that was sort of a background for what's coming up in this chapter after we're through with combinatorics. So um, basically, you can see that we're going to be using mathematics, uh, mathematical techniques to calculate probabilities, but in a very specific and rigorous way. So um, we will be doing a lot of that very soon. But in the meantime, though, um, now we're ready for a handful of very amusing results that really show us some fun things that we can do with this stuff. So we'll start this next one is called how many ways can you arrange a deck of cards? Now, obviously, this involves the factorial operator because it has the word arrangement in it. So uh, I think you'll be very surprised when you watch this video about how large these numbers can get. So um, I, I find this to be a very interesting video. So let me just send off that link to you. And wait till you see, it will be fun. Hold on, let me uh, get you that link. All right, there we are. I am a child without. Pick a card, any card. Actually, just pick up all of them and take a look. This standard 52 card deck has been used for centuries. Every day, thousands just like it are shuffled in casinos all over the world, the order rearranged each time. And yet, every time you pick up a well shuffled deck like this one, you are almost certainly holding an arrangement of cards that has never before existed in all of history. How can this be? The answer lies in how many different arrangements of 52 cards or any objects are possible. Now, 52 may not seem like such a high number, but let's start with an even smaller one. Say we have four people trying to sit in four numbered chairs. How many ways can they be seated? To start off, any of the four people can sit in the first chair. Once this choice is made, only three people remain standing. After the second person sits down, only two people are left as candidates for the third chair. And after the third person has sat down, the last person standing has no choice but to sit in the fourth chair. If we manually write out all the possible arrangements or permutations, it turns out that there are 24 ways that four people can be seated into four chairs. But when dealing with larger numbers, this can take quite a while. So let's see if there's a quicker way. Going from the beginning again, you can see that each of the four initial choices for the first chair leads to three more possible choices for the second chair. And each of those choices leads to two more for the third chair. So instead of counting each final scenario individually, we can multiply the number of choices for each chair, four times three times two times one, to achieve the same result of 24. An interesting pattern emerges. We start with the number of objects we're arranging four in this case, and multiply it by consecutively smaller integers until we reach one. This is an exciting discovery, so exciting that mathematicians have chosen to symbolize this kind of calculation, known as a factorial, with an exclamation mark. As a general rule, the factorial of any positive integer is calculated as the product of that same integer and all smaller integers down to one. In our simple example, the number of ways four people can be arranged into chairs is written as four factorial, which equals 24. So let's go back to our deck. Just as there were four factorial ways of arranging four people, 
there are 52 factorial ways of arranging 52 cards. Fortunately, we don't have to calculate this by hand. Just enter the function into a calculator and it will show you that the number of possible arrangements is 8.07 times 10 to the 67th power, or roughly eight followed by 67 zeros. Just how big is this number? Well, if a new permutation of 52 cards were written out every second, starting 13.8 billion years ago, when the Big Bang is thought to have occurred, the writing would still be continuing today and for millions of years to come. In fact, there are more possible ways to arrange this simple deck of cards than there are atoms on Earth. So the next time it's your turn to shuffle, take a moment to remember that you're holding something that may have never before existed and may never exist again. Oh, that was pretty eye-opening, wasn't it? Just the idea that every time you shuffle up the deck, you may be creating a new arrangement that's never happened before in the history of the Earth. Wow. But that's because the number of possibilities is so astronomical that uh, you can easily see how this could happen. All right. So the next one is kind of interesting because it's actually something that happened in the real world about 100 years ago. Um, this involved a very famous statistician named Ronald Fisher, who's really one of the heavyweights in the field. And um, what happened was apparently he was attending a party in somewhere in England. And um, it was a tea party. So there was a lot of tea being poured and um, other, you know, munchies and things like that. But, you know, it was a tea party. So apparently there was a woman there at the party. And um, uh, and by the way, at this point in time, um, the, a, a very popular version of tea was something called cream tea, where you would put cream or milk in there, and then you would put tea. But what was happening at this party was that um, the waiter came around to this woman, and apparently she still had some milk in her, in her cup, and he offered to pour some tea into that cup. And she said, oh, please don't do that. I prefer to have the tea poured first and then the milk. And so the waiter was skeptical that she could tell the difference between the two. And so Ronald Fisher being Ronald Fisher thought this would be a golden opportunity to test one of my many ideas. And so he set up a little experiment in which he said, all right, here's what we'll do. We'll go into the back in the kitchen and we'll take eight cups of tea. And in half those cases, we'll put the tea followed by the milk. And in the other cases, we'll put the milk followed by the tea. And we'll bring them out without telling her which is which and ask her to try them all and see you know, what she thinks, to write down which ones have tea followed by milk and which ones have milk followed by tea. And then we'll find out pretty quickly if she really knows what she's talking about. Anyway, so I don't want to spoil the ending. So I'll, let's watch the video and see what happened. All right, but it, it actually turns out to be a very important result in, in probability and statistics. So, all right, let's, let's check this out. Or something, get that. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to call it. All right, check this out. Right now, I think I found the single biggest productivity hack in 2020. It's this Google Chrome extension called. We are in Cambridge, England, 1920. Weather could not have been more perfect for high tea on the terrace. We gather at the table as a friendly group of colleagues. The gathering had been progressing in a lively fashion, and the teacups were being refreshed when Lady Otterline abruptly stopped the server 
and he pointed out with disdain that he had poured milk first and then tea, rather than abiding by a widely known preference for tea first and then milk. Side long glances were exchanged by numerous members of our assembled group as they questioned what difference could it possibly make whether milk or tea were poured first in the cup. It made, according to Lady Otterline, all the difference, a difference she could easily taste. It was at this point that I, as a scientist and amateur detective, decided to step in and proposed a little experiment. Safely away from Lady Otterline's line of vision, eight cups of tea were prepared. Four cups with tea poured first, and four with milk poured first, always in equal proportions. Happily, Lady Otterline sampled each of the eight cups and provided the crowd with her judgment of tea or milk first. Remarkably, Lady Otterline identified eight of eight correctly. Could such a feat be accomplished by sheer guesswork? Now, as I mentioned, I'm a scientist above all. As such, I left this little party with more than just some fevers. Indeed, I took with me much food from Try my experiment yourself. Consider all the possible results. What order should your cups be presented? How many cups must be correctly identified to conclude that your subject can truly tell the difference? You will undoubtedly come away with a greater understanding of inferential statistics. All right, well, now we're going to see uh, later on in chapter 12 how to calculate the probability of her getting all eight of them right by pure chance. And it turns out to be well under 1%. So Fisher concluded that because the probability of her getting them all right by pure chance was so close to zero, that she clearly knew what she was talking about. Now, they were surprised to hear this. I mean, they figured, what the heck? How can you tell the difference um, between tea first and milk? But she apparently was able to do it. And she proved it. But um, it did lead Fisher to develop some very important results, which we'll look at again in chapter 12. So anyway, now this next one is more of a, um, another silly application, I guess, of uh, probability theory. <clears throat> but it's a lot of fun. So um, let's take, take a look at this one. All right, hold on, here we go. They're serious about you watching their commercial. They do not want you to escape without every one of them. All right, let's check this one out. Castaway are stranded on a desert island, playing dice for the last banana. You've agreed on these rules. You'll roll two dice, and if the biggest number is one, two, three, or four, player one wins. If the biggest number is five or six, player two wins. Let's try twice more. Here, player one wins. And here, it's player two. So who do you want to be? At first glance, it may seem like player one has the advantage, since she'll win if any one of four numbers is the highest. But actually, player two has an approximately 56% chance of winning each match. One way to see that is to list all the possible combinations you could get by rolling two dice, and then count up the ones that each player wins. These are the possibilities for the yellow die. These are the possibilities for the blue dot. Each cell in the chart shows a possible combination when you roll both dice. If you roll a four and then a five, we'll mark a player two victory in this cell. A three and a one gives player one a victory here. There are 36 possible combinations. 
each with exactly the same chance of happening. Mathematicians call these equal probable events. Now we can see why the first glance was wrong. Even though player one has four winning numbers and player two only has two, the chance of each number being the greatest is not the same. There is only a one in 36 chance that one will be the highest number, but there's an 11 in 36 chance that six will be the highest. So if any of these combinations, player one will win. And if any of these combinations are rolled, player two will win. Out of the 36 possible combinations, 16 give the victory to player one, and 20 give player two the win. You can think about it this way, too. The only way player one can win is if both dice show a one, two, three, or four. A five or six would mean a win for player two. The chance of one die showing one, two, three, or four is four out of six. The result of each die roll is independent from the other. And you can calculate the joint probability of independent events by multiplying their probabilities. So the chance of getting a one, two, three, or four on both dice is four out of six times four out of six, or 16 out of 36. Because someone has to win, the chance of player two winning is 36 out of 36 minus 16 out of 36, or 20 out of 36. Those are the exact same probabilities we got by moving our table. But this doesn't mean that player two will win, or even that if you played 36 games as player two, you win 20 of them. That's why events like dice rolling are called random. Even though you can calculate the theoretical probability of each outcome, you might not get the expected results if you examine just a few events. But if you repeat those random events many, many, many times, of a specific outcome, like a player to win, will approach its theoretical probability. That value we got by writing down all the possibilities and counting up the ones for each outcome. So if you sat on that desert island playing dice forever, player two would eventually win 56% of the games, and player one would win 44%. But by then, of course, the banana would be long gone. All right, now, um, this next one is something that will surprise you to no end, in my opinion. It's, um, this one is actually based on combinatorics and it's called the birthday problem. Well, you'll see why when we get to the video, but it will do, the, the reason why it's so interesting is because it will be very um, shockingly different from your intuition, let's say. It'll, it'll, you'll, you'll be surprised, let's just say by the results. So, all right, let's, let's get this going. And also, some of these videos, if you notice, they're very, very well produced. I mean, they're just fun to watch, even if you had no interest in math at all. In some of these cases, you might want to watch it anyway. I think this is one of those cases. Okay, so let's get this out there. All right, let's watch it. Twenty five million years ago, a new species appeared on Earth. Imagine a group of people. How big do you think the group would have to be before there's more than a 50% chance that two people in the group have the same birthday? Assume for the sake of argument that there are no twins, that every birthday is equally likely, 
and ignore leap years. Take a moment to think about it. The answer may seem surprisingly low. In a group of 23 people, there's a 50.73% chance that two people will share the same birthday. But with 365 days in a year, how is it possible that you need such a small group to get even odds of a shared birthday? Why is our intuition so wrong? To figure out the answer, let's look at one way a mathematician might calculate the odds of a birthday match. We can use a field of mathematics known as combinatorics, which deals with the likelihoods of different combinations. The first step is to flip the problem. Trying to calculate the odds of a match directly is challenging because there are many ways you could get a birthday match in a group. Instead, it's easier to calculate the odds that everyone's birthday is different. How does that help? Either there's a birthday match in the group or there isn't. So the odds of a match and the odds of no match must add up to 100%. That means we can find the probability of a match by subtracting the probability of no match from 100. To calculate the odds of no match, start small. Calculate the odds that just one pair of people have different birthdays. One day of the year will be person A's birthday, which leaves only 364 possible birthdays for person B. The probability of different birthdays for A and B for any pair of people is 364 out of 365, about 0.997 or 99.7%, pretty high. Bring in person C. <laughs> the probability that she has a unique birthday in this small group is 363 out of 365, because there are two birth dates already accounted for by A and B. D's odds will be 362 out of 365, and so on all the way down to W's odds of 343 out of 365. Multiply all of those terms together and you'll get the probability that no one shares a birthday. This works out to 0 0.4927. So there's a 49.27% chance that no one in the group of 23 people shares a birthday. When we subtract that from 100, we get a 50.73% chance of at least one birthday match better than even odds. The key to such a high probability of a match in a relatively small group is the surprisingly large number of possible pairs. As a group grows, the number of possible combinations gets bigger much faster. A group of five people has 10 possible pairs. Each of the five people can be paired with any of the other four. Half of those combinations are redundant, because pairing person A with person B is the same as pairing B with A, so we divide by two. By the same reasoning, a group of 10 people has 45 pairs, and a group of 23 has 253. The number of pairs grows quadratically, meaning it's proportional to the square of the number of people in the group. Unfortunately, our brains are notoriously bad at intuitively grasping nonlinear functions. So it seems improbable at first that 23 people could produce 253 possible pairs. Once our brains accept that, the birthday problem makes more sense. Every one of those 253 pairs is a chance for a birthday match. For the same reason, in a group of 70 people, there are 2,415 possible pairs, and the probability that two people have the same birthday is more than 99.9%. The birthday problem is just one example where math can show that things that seem impossible, like the same person winning the lottery twice, actually aren't unlikely at all. Sometimes coincidences aren't as coincidental as they seem.
Wow, that was interesting. Um, who would have thought? It only takes 23 people in the room before there's a 50-50 chance of getting two people with the same birthday. Now, normally when I show this video in the classroom, I always, as an experiment, um, ask people what their birthdays are and I start to write them down. And then almost without fail, we discover that yes, there are two people with the same birthday. Um, usually my classes have about 25 people in them. So it almost never fails, even though it's supposed to be 50-50. I, I can only remember one time when no two people had the same birthdays. It's kind of interesting. And in fact, the one time when I did this, the first two people I, I asked had the same birthday. It was just unbelievable. Just as soon as we got to the first two, that's it. We've already got our match. Um, and so that surprises everyone, but it's true. Like he said, that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around these nonlinear relationships with gigantic numbers, and it just becomes a jumble. But so intuitively, you would have thought maybe that it takes 150, 180, a lot of people to make sure there's a 50% chance of getting the same birthday. But no, it's much, much smaller than that. All right, so I'm, we've got one more here. Now, this one is not related really to probability theory. This is just something that's fun and interesting and something you may have been exposed to in high school, um, or I shouldn't say exposed to, introduced to. Um, it's just one of these amusing mathematical results that I think today would be the day to do this uh, video because, of course, we're, we're going to have a vacation any minute now. And so um, I'd like you to see this because I just think it happens to be so interesting. And like I said, you may have run into this before. Um, it, it can be related to combinatorics, but it's meant for a lot of other applications as well. So it's called Pascal's Triangle. And it a, has a very interesting history. What's it like so, uh, okay. to learn math? Uh, uh, no, let's stop that now. All right, so let me fire this off to you. And see how you like it. All right. Brilliant gives you hands on to help you learn by doing learn topics this may look like a neatly arranged stack of numbers but it's actually a mathematical treasure trove indian mathematicians called it the staircase of mount meru in iran it's the kayam triangle and in china it's yang wei's triangle to much of the Western world, it's known as Pascal's Triangle, after French mathematician Blaise Pascal, which seems a bit unfair since he was clearly late to the party, but he still had a lot to contribute. So what is it about this that has so intrigued mathematicians the world over? In short, it's full of patterns and secrets. First and foremost, there's the pattern that generates it. Start with one and imagine invisible zeros on either side of it. Add them together in pairs and you'll generate the next row. Now do that again and again. Keep going and you'll wind up with something like this. Though really Pascal's triangle goes on infinitely. Now each row corresponds to what's called the coefficients of a binomial expansion of the form x plus y raised to the n, where n is the number of the row, and we start counting from zero. So if you make n equal 2 and expand it, you get x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. The coefficients, or numbers in front of the variables, are the same as the numbers in that row of Pascal's triangle. You'll see the same thing with n equals 3, which expands to this. So the triangle is a quick and easy way to look up all of these coefficients. But there's much more. For example, add up the numbers in each row, and you'll get successive powers of 2. Or in a given row, treat each number as part of a decimal expansion. In other words, row 2 is 1 times 1 plus 2 times 10 plus 1 times 100. You get 121, which is 11 squared. And take a look at what happens when you do the same thing to row six. It adds up to 1,771,561, which is 11 to the sixth, and so on. There are also geometric applications. Look at the diagonals. The first two aren't very interesting. All ones, and then the positive integers, also known as natural numbers. But the numbers in the next diagonal 
are called the triangular numbers, because if you take that many dots, you can stack them into equilateral triangles. The next diagonal has the tetrahedral numbers, because similarly, you can stack that many spheres into tetrahedra. Or how about this? Shade in all of the odd numbers. It doesn't look like much when the triangle's small, but if you add thousands of rows, you get a fractal known as Sierpinski's triangle. This triangle isn't just a mathematical work of art. It's also quite useful, especially when it comes to probability and calculations in the domain of combinatorics. Say you want to have five children and would like to know the probability of having your dream family of three girls and two boys. In the binomial expansion, that corresponds to girl plus boy to the fifth power. So we look at the row five, where the first number corresponds to five girls, and the last corresponds to five boys. The third number is what we're looking for, 10 out of the sum of all the possibilities in the row. So 10 over 32 or 31.25%. Or if you're randomly picking a five player basketball team out of a group of 12 friends, how many possible groups of five are there? In combinatoric terms, this problem would be phrased as 12 choose five and could be calculated with this formula. Or you could just look at the sixth element of row 12 on the triangle and get your answer. The patterns in Pascal's triangle are a testament to the elegantly interwoven fabric of mathematics. And it's still revealing fresh secrets to this day. For example, mathematicians recently discovered a way to expand it to these kinds of polynomials. What might we find next? Well, that's up to you. <clears throat> Wow, I think they're hinting that maybe you should become mathematicians and spend the rest of your life studying Pascal's triangle. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> well, anyway, so uh, so we're done with the combinatorics part of the chapter. We're, now we're going to start the actual probability theory. Uh, I mean, not right now, but that's what's coming next. Now, of course, next week we're off. So I hope you have a fun spring break. And when we get back, uh, we'll pick it up where we left off with chapter 11. And just keep in mind, that the final exam is entirely based on chapters 11 and 12. So it's not comprehensive. So you might be happy to hear that. And in the meantime, I guess I'll just say, um, like I said, and hopefully you'll have a great spring break and I'll see you all a week from Monday. Okay. Unless there's last minute questions, of course.